lot of you have probably heard about the, the Lost Birds Project. Um, some of you have att attended trainings about this in the past. Are any of you unfamiliar with this piece? <laughs> Would any of you like to, me to talk about it? Briefly. Talk about Briefly. Oh, okay. You've got new signs. We all I'm want so glad. Yes, we got new signs. Oh, that's um, so great. And we're working on um, new ones for the entire sculpture. Which oh, is that's really, really great. Nice. Good. Um, so Todd McGrain. They're not uh, very attractive. Yeah, very informative. Well, so we'll have new ones. There's new ones that are being made oh, that really? are metal, oh, okay. blend in really well with the surroundings. They're weatherproof. <laughs> um, Same we'll birds, or do we have more that have gone extinct? Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. Probably more. Um, but Todd McGrain is a wonderful artist. He was an uh, artist in residence at the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology when this was installed. So he works closely with scientists and researchers. Um, and the idea was to... Um, elevate uh, the knowledge and um, understanding of uh, animals that we have lost. Uh, Tom McGrain says that um, this museum celebrates celebrates wildlife, but it's important to add an element of wildlife we've lost because if we forget, it's too easy to let what we have now slip away. Um, so he found it very important to add that element of loss of extinction into the the greater plan for the sculpture trail. Um, so it's sadness, but it's also an education, and through education, we can help save other species that are potentially suffering the same fate. Uh, so these are one, two, three, four, five birds, um, the heath hen, the Labrador duck, the Carolina parakeet, passenger pigeon, and great auk, who are driven to extinction um, by humans. Um, so we made them life-size so that we could relate, or human-size, so that we could relate more directly with them. Um, he selected the birds that he did because, of course, they're all driven to extinction in modern times, but also by their variety of forms, habitat, and causes of extinction. And each one of these statues is also located, there's one other statue of each of these, that is located in the exact location where that bird was last seen. Um, so the last known one of the species of the guy. Um, so there's a map on his and website. And is that the one that's in the side that's great awkward, same, exactly. same size. Same this. size, exactly the same sculpture. So that would be in Fogo Island in Newfoundland, just on the coast. Just a, a very remote island. This sculpture is out looking over the ocean, sort of forlornly. The last uh, great awk was seen there. And of course the heath hen, Martha's Vineyard. The Carolina parakeet is um, on a preserve in Florida. Um, the last one, known one was there. The passenger pigeon, Columbus, Ohio. Um, in an Audubon Center. The last one passed away there, so that's where that sculpture is. And the Labrador duck, the last one was seen um, in Elmira, New York, in a park. Um, so that's where they are. That's where they're placed. Oh, okay. the outdoors. And on our, um, yeah, on the, this app. You see it you see in it. Newfoundland. Yeah. Really is that on our website? Uh, right so we, there's an app. app. And I can help you guys download that app uh, okay. after oh, this. Is it a Lost Birds app? Uh, no, no, it's the no, sculpture trail app. Oh, okay. It tells you next. Oh, and then right. you can okay. even listen to the artist to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. Are it's you allowed to touch outdoor yeah. sculptures or not? So that's kind of a fine line. Um, I think that has a fingerprint, right? A handprint right in the middle. Yeah. Of so there are, so Buffalo Mountain, which we'll talk about, there's an invitation to climb through it, play on it, touch it. And people definitely touch these sculptures, but I think Emily and our, uh, our registrar would tell you not to. There are oils on our hands that over time could change the patina. So it's not advised. <laughs> um, so he says there's a physical sympathy that is elicited because these birds are the same size as us. We can feel their pain. Um, and he got, he got the inspiration for this by a book, um, an author named Christopher Coquinos. It's called Hope is a Thing with Feathers, um, sort of a tribute to the Emily Dickinson poem. Uh, and he says uh, that Coquinos focused on all these birds in addition to some others, um, talked about their extinctions um, and in recent times. So he read that book and then was inspired to create this. And uh, we still have huge cutouts down in the basement of all of these birds. And Adam and um, some other people who were installing the pieces put the cardboard cutouts at different places around the, the sculpture trail. And they're life-size, so they're huge, and they're downstairs um, to, to find out where exactly they wanted to place them. So it's crude, but it was very effective. <laughs> and uh, I heard tell he may want to move them again, maybe? Really? Um, we'll see. Maybe mm -hmm. in the future. That would be a little complicated. Yeah, it would be. But we've got the cutouts, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> we still have them down there. 
um, but just a tribute to what is lost uh, and an education about how we can help in the future. And there's a great website for the Lost Birds Project. Now, where is that website? Is it on the uh, National just, Museum of Wildlife? You Arts can website? just Google Lost, Lost, Lost Birds Project oh, and it'll come right up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are videos and okay, good. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's good. Really so, um, and I'll just read you the mission of the Lost Birds Project quickly. The belief that underlies this initiative is that art can t touch each of us in a way that ideas and intellect alone cannot. At their highest levels, the performing arts and the visual arts have the power to ignite an awareness of deep connectedness. While we do not advocate for any specific actions, our hope is that by raising awareness, each of us will hear and respond to our own unique calling to engage with the shift towards a better relationship to the earth. To me, that is the mission of the National Museum of Wildlife Art, so um, it really fits well here. All right, guys, let's mosey on over to Kelsey's piece. So you guys can um, feel free to face me so you don't have to have the sun in your face. And maybe come up on the sidewalk. We'll leave some room for the cars if you guys want to just true. Um, all right, so this sculpture, I feel, is so fitting to be placed sort of as an introduction to the museum when you drive up uh, for a few reasons. Um, oh, it, I'll first say it's called Change of Seasons. Um, when you look at this massive sculpture, what are what um, are some things that you notice? Where does your eye go first? Mom and baby. Mom and baby. Yeah, it looks like there's sort of a protection, some sort of sense of protection going on. With that's the, a mom. Well, that's a big. Good. Could be a mom. Yeah. Well, one is bigger it than the other, male so maybe male and female. Maybe yeah. male and female. Yeah, male and female. Yeah. Boyfriend, girlfriend. Yep, totally. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you guys notice about this? The texture, right? The texture. That's is, huge. It seems like it's. We'll talk about that. Yeah, incredible texture. You kind of see the light and shadow shimmering off the piece with all the texture. And there's movement. Do you guys windy. see where there's movement? What was that? It's windy. windy. Totally windy. From so you see side. the beer just oh, flowing. Oh, yeah. wind. Um, and then change of seasons come, comes into play because you see that they're shedding their pelts. Or they're... Um, that could make it. Yeah, early so summer, early summer maybe. Uh, so that's in here in the piece. You see this change of seasons represented by the animal. Um, and I like to talk about this piece uh, with um, young kids in, in this way. Uh, as, as a form of inspiration. So, for example, uh, there's a story. Uh, bison and cows behave very differently when a storm comes. Some of you may know this. Uh, so, a massive storm is brewing, um, we'll say, in the west, and uh, there's a group of cows and a group of bison. Uh, the cows will see the storm, get a little bothered, and start walking away from it, slowly walking away from it as this huge, massive storm looms in the west. There's wind blowing, there's hail, maybe a tornado, but the cows are just like slowly walking away from it. Now the bison, on the other hand, will turn directly into the storm, the crest of the storm, and just walk right into it, plowing through the storm. Um, so they face hardship straight on, these bison. Uh, and in that way, who do you think is better off, the bison or the cow, if a storm is slowly coming over the horizon. Is it better to walk right into it or to slowly walk away from it? <clears throat> it's better to walk into it because then it passes over you very quickly. It's a minor inconvenience, maybe some hail damage, um, but you're going you're gonna to walk through that storm very quickly, whereas the cows are following it for the entirety of the storm and they're just getting rained on for hours, uh, where the bison, it's only a quick rain. So facing your troubles, I always say, you like the bison, like bison. it's much better than slowly walking away from them. Um, and I see that every time I look at this. They're facing into the storm, facing the hardships, um, facing, uh, you know, that maybe the bison is a huge symbol for loss. Um, it's a symbol of the American West. It's a, the new national mammal of the United States of America. It's also the state mammal of Wyoming. So it's a symbol of Native Americans. It's also a symbol of hope. Officially? Uh, officially, it's the symbol, the, the animal of the mammal. United yeah. States? Recently. I think under Obama? I'm not sure. But yeah, recently. This is the state mammal. <laughs> and the national mammal. And the national mammal. Yes, that too. Um, <laughs> and I always like to say people say, are bison really that big? And I, you know, uh, in the Pleistocene, yes. <laughs> they were this big. They were huge. Um, so at one point, we had bison that were this big walking across the plains, which is kind of awesome to think about. Um, so a powerful symbol and an inspiration to visitors as they come. Uh, and T.D. Kelsey... And T.D. Kelsey was an adventurer. 
Um, he was an airplane pilot um, and he retired in the late 70s to take up sculpting um, as his full-time passion. Uh, he was a rodeo star. He um, trained um, cutting horses, which is not an easy task. He raised uh, and trained cutting horses. He raised, and he has a, a ranch out in Bozeman, Montana, and has traveled the world. And he also sculpts African wildlife. And if you've been to the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, his pieces are all over the front. They're beautiful. Um, he has some pieces in Spain, so he's a very well-known artist. And you mentioned texture. So he's also considered an impressionist sculptor. A lot of people understand impressionism as a form of painting. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, the term impressionism is derived from a single painting, Claude Monet's painting, Impression Sol, Soleil Levant, Impression Sunrise. It was uh, Monet's impression, visual impression, of what the sunrise looked like outside in plein air. Um, and so impressionism um, in sculpture, uh, in, uh, sculptors try to reflect the reality and temporariness of of a scene, um, and they use that, uh, they use irregular surfaces, texture, um, to get that sunlight glittering down on them, much like Monet's um, landscapes with the sunlight reflecting shadow and dark. Um, and also they like to show the process of creation. So those fingerprints crack, you know, molded into the clay, you see where he scraped it with his fingernails, um, and he's building up these layers of clay so that you can see them, see his process. Uh, so that's all part of Impressionist sculptor, Sculpture, and uh, Renoir, is it Renoir? Um, Rodin, sorry, is uh, considered the a genius of Impressionist sculptor, Sculpture, um, and Bugatti as well. We have some of his pieces in the museum. So it can be in sculpt sculpting as well as painting. So this piece is really interesting. It's by a, a female sculptor, Sandy Scott, and I was reading, um, she has a catalog we had one of her retrospectives here at the museum not too long ago, and her catalog is called The Spirit of Wild Things, and Bill Kerr, uh, the founder of the, this museum, uh, wrote the foreword for Sandy Scott. He said of her, the emerging quality of women who sculpt and paint is the result of their exceptional skills and amazing tenacity, as well as our own social maturity. During the entire span of her career, Sandy has been a force in the efforts of contemporary women to achieve parity of recognition, acceptance, and critical evaluation with their male colleagues. Um, so Sandy has had a, a battle um, to gain recognition like her male counterparts, but has achieved it. Um, she's an amazing sculptor. And uh, we have a lot of her pieces in, in our collection. And she was also an avid hunter. She was hardcore, <laughs> this woman. Um, so she was, she's a pilot. A lot of her pieces are of birds. And uh, this piece, there's a, a vignette, a small sculpture that she used as the, um, um, as the inspiration for this larger piece. Uh, that was of a moose that she shot out of an airplane. Um, you're not actually allowed to do that anymore, I don't think, shoot out of planes, but they were spotting them in, in Canada, and she said she shot the moose from the plane, from the door of the plane, um, and the recoil catapulted her backwards. She almost fell out of the plane. Her father grabbed her by the jeans and pulled her back in, um, but the shot was a su success, and they um, ate moose chili. Uh, so she has a recipe for moose chili next to the picture of this in her catalog, <laughs> which tells you a lot about her. Fascinating woman, and, and of course, a lot of male uh, wildlife artists were also hunters. Um, so it's interesting to think of her in that same vein. Um, but she said of the little vignette that the small study is called Moose and Muck. Um, uh, she says long, gangly legs, big humped nose, mule-like ears, and enormous antlers. She says the moose is ugly in a compelling way. This is funny. And uh, Jane always points out that the hump of the back and the undulation of the moose mimics the mountains in the background. Uh, um, and they actually had it installed in a different location, and she didn't like it, so they moved it. You can see where the um, front hood hoof used to be was here, um, but they moved it a little bit to the left, um, I think is what it was. But one of these feet were moved after it was installed because she wasn't didn't think the um, installation location was perfect, but now it is. Lisa? Yeah. Do you know why this moose's ears are flat like that against Ooh. its body? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that question out to everyone else. When you see an animal <laughs> with the ears back, what is that? Usually, well, they're usually they're startled. Yeah, yeah. Startled, yeah. Anger. They're feeling aggressive. They're feeling aggressive. But if this moose is stuck in muck and it's trying to get its foot out, maybe it's just frustrated. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, maybe it is aggressive. Maybe we'll it, ask her when she comes. You should. Yeah.
And maybe that's the look it gave her when she was hanging out of the airplane with her gun. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, so she's an exciting woman, has led an exciting life, and uh, isn't, we're lucky to have her sculptures here. Also an impressionist style of sculpting. Okay, quickly over to Buffalo Mountain, and then we'll end with ISIS. Um, I encourage you guys, after this talk, to come up and feel these pieces. Uh, they're solid granite, but he's polished the inside, the interior. Um, artist named Stuart Steinauer, he was born in 1959, um, and he spent uh, his young life on a, a, the Seto Lake Cree Indian Reserve in Alberta. So he is Scotch-Irish and also um, Mohawk, Anishinaabe, which also is Cree Ojibwe, um, and some other native uh, background. So he uh, really pays attention to his native heritage, and he says something very interesting in that um, he says, I am not a gifted artist. Um, I don't have any talent. He says that point blank. I have no talent, not a gifted artist. He says, everything I do is channeled um, through the Great Spirit. So he says he is someone who inadvertently makes stuff because he's compelled to do so um, by the spirits, by his ancestors, to create these works. So he says it has nothing to do with him, which I think is kind of beautiful. Um, so these two pieces are encouraged to climb on by kids. And um, there's a... But there's no sound. There's no... There will be. <laughs> They're working on it. I think um, it's kind of confusing. I agree. I agree. That will change very soon. They have all the signs in the curatorial office. They just need to install them. Is that no, They're still being made. There's some that are in there. <laughs> on the uh, app it says you can climb. The, on the app it says you can climb. <laughs> um, so these are okay. Uh, and some really funny things about these is there are uh, similar pieces are installed in Canada and there's a uh, groups of people who will do some sort of rebirthing ceremonies and crawl through the hole on the other side. Um, and the story goes that there's a, an entity called the, the Rock Grandfather, or the Rock Spirit, um, from which um, he gets uh, his inspiration as well. And uh, when all the uh, great herds of buffalo were almost gone, uh, the Great Spirit saw, the Rock Grandfather saw that this was happening and opened a massive hole um, in the side of a mountain, in which all of the bison, remaining bison went through. So they kind of went into this other dimension, suspended in time, waiting for, um, for a chance to come back, a time when the earth was ready for them, when humans were ready for them. They could return and then repopulate um, the areas that they once traveled. So this is showing, you know, going through to, a, to another place, um, waiting for a safe time to return. Uh, and Jane always says something really beautiful that uh, when children play on this, um, it represents the hope uh, for future generations uh, and, and like the bison, the, the hope that they will once again return to a safe place. So, um, kind of nice. And this is Little Buffalo Mountain, so this is the baby. Um, pretty cute. Let's see if I've forgotten anything. Um, yeah. So as children today climb through the tunnel in this granite bison, we're reminded of transformation, and then there is hope for a future in which people and wildlife can peacefully coexist. So that kind of summarizes the sculpture. This piece. And uh, when it was installed, Jane asked the artist if he had ever crawled through. I think he kind of sheepishly said no, <laughs> and she said, "Well, you should." And I think he kind of looked around. And he went through. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, let's uh, continue on to Isis. Uh, yeah. So this piece uh, I find very beautiful. It's titled Isis uh, by the artist Simon Gudgeon. And Isis, uh, is anybody familiar with who Isis is? And so uh, it's a goddess in Egyptian mythology, um, and she is the goddess of nature, essentially. Um, Isis uh, was a major goddess in ancient Egyptian religion, the mother of Horus a symbol of feminine divinity. Um, she's often described as a bird goddess, if you see her in hieroglyphs. It's a female with birds attached to bird wings like this. Um, and the wings represent protection. Uh, her maternal aid was invoked in healing spells to benefit ordinary people. So this is a healing, protector, um, female goddess of nature. Uh, very fitful for 
uh, this, the sculpture trail here. Uh, and Simon Gudgeon is an interesting guy. Uh, he is considered w one of England's leading contemporary sculptors. And there are only two of uh, these pieces uh, this big um, elsewhere. One is in his amazing estate called Sculptures by the Lake. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, and the other one um, is Hyde, oh, Hyde Park. Park. Exactly, right. Hyde Park, yes. Um, and then, of course, we have one here. And Prince, he Prince Charles apparently has a small one on his estate to look at and to hang out with. Um, but Simon Gudgeon came to art late in life. He was a lawyer, um, very wealthy guy, owned this massive estate, and then tried his hand at sculpting. And Jane said he's probably only been sculpting for 15 years or so, so not that long. And that's so? Yeah. And his estate is gorgeous. I highly recommend you guys look it up on, online. Uh, Sculptures by the Lake. It is. If you pay 15 euros, you can go too and hang out. They have an amazing um, place to eat. They have tours, sculptures everywhere. Very peaceful place that you can connect to nature through his art. Um, and he says uh, his sculpture should resonate with the viewer and have a subconscious appeal to your emotions. Whether these emotions are the same as his or not, he doesn't care. What is important is that you connect with the art. Um, and this piece right here was donated by the Halcyon Gallery in London uh, that represents him. And we came to know him through Western Visions. He was invited to participate, and then a great friendship um, between um, Simon and the museum happened, and um, he donated this piece. So it's really wonderful. We have a smaller version as well in the collection. Um, and his sculpture in Hyde Park was the first sculpture by a living artist to be installed in Hyde Park. Um, so that's how uh, much people revere him in England. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of a uh, kind of it for for Isis, but uh, this beautiful protective goddess overlooking the sculpture trail and the elk refuge, um, helping us to connect to nature. Um, yeah. um, Want to go look at some more art inside?